Welcome back to another episode of Table Talk Online from the Christian Worldview Project. My name is Jordan. Uh, we do this primarily and ultimately for the glory of God by presenting the Christian worldview in order to provide a biblical foundation for the defense of the Christian faith. This ministry is under the oversight of Salitran Covenant Bible Church a local church in the city of Dasmariñas, Cavite, here in the Philippines, under the care of Pastor Jeremiah Hangad, and we do adhere to the 1689 London Baptist Confession of Faith. And if you haven't yet, please subscribe and hit that notification bell so you don't miss any future content. And tonight, for tonight's podcast, uh, of course, evening here in the Philippines, uh, for tonight's podcast, I will be having Dr. Jason Lyle on the show. Uh, he's been with us. Uh, the past few months, we tackled science and apologetics, and he is with us today or tonight. So, uh, good morning, Jason Lyle. Uh, good evening, there. Jordan. <laughs> <laughs> so, how is it going over there uh, in your area? It's going well. It's going well. We, of course, we had uh, events, a lot of events canceled because of the uh, COVID situation, but uh, I've got. Uh, two coming up uh, next month. So we're starting to get back into things. And the, the downtime gave me time to write a lot of articles. So uh, the Lord's been good. Yeah, it's actually beneficial. Uh, this pandemic situation, we, we we had a lot of, you know, me personally, uh, I had a lot of guests internationally. Uh, you, <laughs> of course, uh, I already had um, James Anderson. Also, Ray Comfort uh, a few hours ago. So Ray Comfort was on our show. And uh, yeah, I also thank uh, Sister Denise for accommodating my email, of course, uh, to be able to reach out with you. So yeah, for those who are new to this channel uh, and uh, first time seeing Dr. Jason Lyle on the show. So Dr. Jason, would you mind telling us a bit about yourself before we get started? Well, the most important thing is I'm a Christian. I was a sinner and I've been saved by God's grace. Very grateful for that. Uh, I am an astrophysicist. I enjoy science, and I founded the Biblical Science Institute three years ago, and our ministry is really designed to show people that science confirms the Christian worldview. Secularists try to argue that science somehow disproves Christianity, especially in Genesis. They argue that evolution must be true and so on, and uh, I, I'm not persuaded by that. I'm persuaded of the opposite, that if you really understand science, uh, it comes out of a Christian worldview. So that's really what I try to uh, help people with. I'm, I'm doing apologetics, helping people over those stumbling blocks that would uh, intellectually uh, prevent them from coming to the Christian faith. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for that. And uh, we will be talking about his book, Keeping Faith in the Age of Reason. So Dr. Jason Lyle, would you mind telling us a bit about this book? Uh, could you also tell us what is the background of this book, uh, the title, and uh, how did you, uh, you know, compile the 420 uh, alleged Bible contradictions? <laughs> it, you know, the people, uh, it, the internet is just flooded with all kinds of criticisms against, against Christianity. And the internet's kind of leveled the playing field because it used to be, in order to get something published, it would have to have some level of credibility to it for, for the publisher to actually try and publish it. But with the internet, anybody can post anything they want. Mm -hmm. And so there's this there's this popular list that's already been compiled of uh, criticisms against the Bible uh, saying, well, you can't trust the Bible because it's got all these contradictions. There's this list of over 400 contradictions and uh, people will put that up on the Internet, especially, you know, to just to troll Christians. And they'll mm -hmm. say, well, see, you know, there's no way you can trust the Bible because look at all these contradictions. Yeah. And people get intimidated by that because they think, well, granted, maybe. A lot of those are false, but you know, you know, there's so many. Perhaps at least a few of them are true. Well, no, they're not. And so what I did was I took that list and I went through uh, each and every one of them and investigated it, and I found that not not even one of them was was contradictory when you actually went and looked at the text carefully. Mm -hmm. And in most cases, it's just the the uh, critic was not reading the text very carefully. But there were a few where I had to go back and check the original language. Mm -hmm. Because you know there are translation issues, things of that nature, and there are a few where there are textual variants, uh, and and uh, and and that sort. So it was it was actually a fun project. I really enjoyed it. I and I, um, there, especially with the ones that were a little bit more difficult, where I had to go back and really study the text, and you're like, oh, mm -hmm. okay, it it does make sense when you understand the the actual text and what the author's saying. Yeah, 
And uh, thank you so much for that. So where did you get uh, these lists from? Uh, is there a particular site that you, you get it or where? Yes, and I, I put the uh, the address, the web address in the book. So the book, here's mm. the book. And yep. uh, if you, yeah, if you pick, I, somewhere in the book, I forget where it is, early on, I, I mentioned the web address. But the interesting thing is one of the, and I think I put a couple different links up to it, but one of them's disappeared. So uh, maybe they decide, I don't know, maybe they decided that's not such a good list after all. So yeah. but you can find it. If you just do a search for over 400 or 439, because uh, some of them were duplicates, mm -hmm. uh, uh, Bible contradictions, you can find it on the internet. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually planning on, uh, you know, doing a Filipino version, a Tagalog version of, uh, you know, having uh, having a series of episodes and uh, uh, do it in our context here in the Philippines. So this book is really helpful. If you want to grab a copy, uh, where do we uh, where do we go? You can get it on our website, BiblicalScienceInstitute.com. Mm -hmm. Biblical, one word, BiblicalScienceInstitute.com. Go to our web store and you'll mm -hmm. you'll see it there among our other our other resources. All right. So thank you so much for those information. And uh yeah, let's dive right into the the QA portion. So let's define our terms first. Dr. Jason Lyle, what is the meaning of contradiction? What is a contradiction? A contradiction is where you have A and not A at the same time and in the same sense, where A is any proposition, any statement that has a truth value like true or false. And mm -hmm. so if I said my car is in the parking lot, and it's not the case that my car is in the parking lot, that would be a contradiction. Uh, you can form the contradiction of any particular term, A, by just adding, it is not the case that. And so if, if somebody says the sky is blue, you can make the contradictory statement, it is not the case that the sky is blue. And when those two statements are combined, you have a contradiction. The mm -hmm. combination of A and not A is always false. When A and not A are in the same sense and at the same time. It can it can be the case that the sky is blue today and not the case that the sky is blue tomorrow because they're two different mm -hmm. times. Yep. And and you have to make sure that the sense is the same as well. Uh, can you be a married bachelor? Well, you can be a bachelor in the sense of not married to a person, but you can be married to your work. And so and that's, that's a different sense. And you're gonna find that in a lot of the cases uh, where the the critic has claimed a contradiction, it's not really yeah. a contradiction because the time is different, or mm -hmm. the sense is different. Yep. Okay. Thank you so much for that. And uh, the book actually, uh, the book uh, was actually divided, uh, beautifully broken down uh, into categories. So we have the introduction, quantitative differences, names, places, and genealogies, times of events, cause effect. Uh, differences in details, yes or no, and closing remarks. So let's go to, of course, the introduction you have already exhausted, uh, discuss contradictions and logical fallacies. We're not going to deal with that. Let's dive right into the quantitative differences. Uh, could you tell us a bit about uh, this section? So, yeah, what I did was I tried to organize the the errors into different categories. And quantitative differences is where somebody claims that the Bible gives a different number in one place than it does in another place. And a lot of those are resolved by what I call, um, or they've committed the error, what I would call the subset fallacy. One example is when uh, Jesus encounters a uh, demon-possessed man, and two of the Gospels record that he, he encountered a demon-possessed man, and the, another Gospel records that there were two demon-possessed mm -hmm. men. And uh, people say, well, that's a contradiction. No, that's not a contradiction, because if Jesus encountered two men, then he necessarily encountered one man and one other man. <laughs> now, mm -hmm. for whatever reason, two of the Gospels only focused on the one man, and I, my suspicion is he was far more intense than the other, far more memorable. He's the one that Jesus encounters later, so uh, they, they only mention the one man. That doesn't mean the other one's not present, and mm -hmm. so that's an example of the subset fallacy. If I said I'm holding up ten fingers and I'm holding up five fingers, that is not a contradiction because if I'm holding up 10 fingers, I'm necessarily holding up five fingers and five mm -hmm. more. Yep. But the fact that I haven't mentioned the other five is logically irrelevant. It's not a contradiction. And so most of the errors in this category or, or in this section of the book, most of most of the errors made by the critic fall into that subset, uh, subset fallacy. But there are a few others as well. There's a semantic range fallacy and so on. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. yeah. And uh, this actually uh, takes me back to the Garden of Eden where Satan put the confusion uh, to the truth of God's word to Eve. Uh, what is your take on that? Well, yeah, I mean, Satan's good at that. That's what he does. He, he, um, he says, did God really say? That's effectively mm -hmm. what, what Satan was asking uh, Eve. Did God really say you should not eat from that tree? And the interesting thing is Eve, in her response, uh, apparently added to God's word a little bit because she said, you know, God said you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it lest you die. God mm -hmm. never said you, you shall not touch it. So there was some kind of communication problem there or, or Eve was perhaps adding to God's word, trying to make it look a little more restrictive than it really was. Mm -hmm. But um, but Satan appealed to Eve's uh, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life, the same ways in which Jesus was tempted. But Jesus, uh, of course, uh, resisted all, the, all those three temptations. But Eve's looking at that tree. It's it's beautiful. It, it it's you know it, it makes you wise, uh, mm -hmm. or potentially that's what she was under the impression anyway. It was to be desired to that aspect. So she, her lust and her um, uh, and her desire to be wise, her pride of life. Uh, caused her to fall into sin. Jesus is tempted in the same way. He responds with scripture. He quotes scripture, which I think yep. is interesting. Uh, yep. Sa Satan tries to tempt him and, and Jesus responds with scripture. And uh, that's how he was able to, uh, to resist those temptations. Yep. And uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Jesus Christ presupposes his, his word. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And yeah. uh, it's okay. him. So, so, yeah. Yeah. So let's start with, uh, you have here the number one. Okay. I remember uh, not only atheists bring this up, but also Muslims. So how many men, uh, in number one, uh, under the category of uh, quantitative differences? So how many men did the chief of David's captain uh, kills? Uh, uh, 2 Samuel 23, 8 says 800, but uh, 1 Chronicles eleven eleven says 300. So how do we reconcile that? Yeah, this is a classic example of the subset fallacy. If he killed 800, he necessarily killed 300 and 500 more. So there's no problem there. Um, the, the interesting thing is, uh, the, it, the, why, why is it separated out? Why does one say, why does one only record the 300? And it, apparently it has to do with the method of uh, death. Uh, the 300 men that were killed were killed with a spear. Specifically, that's what the Bible says in First Chronicles. Now, um, in 2 Samuel, in the original text, it doesn't say that they were killed with a weapon. Now, I've learned that I think the King James adds that they were killed with a spear, but that's not in the original text. Mm -hmm. So apparently the additional 500 were killed with a different weapon. And so that's why you have the, the, the different number there. So 300 killed with a spear, 800 killed total. Makes perfect sense, perfectly consistent. Mm -hmm. there's, no, there's no contradiction there. So why do you think uh, these uh, people uh, brought this contradiction up? Uh, do you think uh, they just failed to do their homework? <laughs> yeah, I think in most cases that's it. In fact, at the end of the book, I um, yeah, at the end of the book on page two thirty six, I list the the errors that the critic makes by how often he makes them, and the the number one error that the critic makes is simply a failure to read the text carefully or in context. Mm -hmm. which is amazing. And I haven't even included this one in that. That one I've included as a subset fallacy, which is one, two, three, four, five, six, the sixth most common error. But the, the most common <laughs> error is they're just not reading the text carefully. They're reading it like a, like a child would and not yeah. thinking through things. And so I, I found that very revealing. It really kind of shows that the critic is really uh, motivated to not want to believe God's word, which is what the Bible says anyway. So in their resistance to God's word, they demonstrate the truth of God's word, interestingly. Amen. All right, uh, let's move on and have, okay. In number 16, under uh, the, the category of quantitative uh, differences, uh, did Jesus say before uh, the cock crows or before the cock crows twice in Matthew 26, 34, Luke 22, 34, and John, so on and so forth, but in Mark 14, 30, he says, before the cock crows twice. So mm -hmm. uh, was that a contradiction? Again, it's another uh, subset fallacy because if the cock uh, crows twice, it necessarily crows once and then once more. Now, the interesting thing, of course, is that uh, Matthew, Luke, and John do not record the detail of that it would be the second uh, crow. 
but mm -hmm. uh, that does, they don't contradict it either. They don't say, you know, the first time the cock crows, you'll deny me. That's not what they say. They just say that when the cock crows, you'll have denied me three times. And that is true. And the fact that it was the second time that the cock uh, crowed is recorded only in uh, Mark, in Mark 14, 30. So the mm -hmm. fact that one gospel gives additional details to the others does not disprove the others. It just means they give additional details than the others. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the, the difference is, is uh, one recorded and uh, the other one recorded something. So it's not a contradiction. Yeah, so there's no contradiction. Just one gave more detail. Mark gives mm -hmm. more detail in this case, which is unusual because Mark's the shorter uh, gospel, of course. But uh, in this in this instance, Mark gave the additional detail that it was in fact the second time that the cock would crow that uh, in which uh, after would deny Christ three times. The others omit that detail because it wasn't germane to the, the, the story. Each gospel writer has to choose what details he's going to include and what he's mm -hmm. going to omit. Uh, you can't record everything that Jesus did because all the books yep. in the world couldn't contain that, you know, and then he took yep. another breath and then he took another breath. Well, that would be ridiculous. Every, <laughs> every gospel writer has to choose what details to include and omit. And, and a lot of times uh, certain events are telescoped where they'll leave out a, a big chunk, but that doesn't make them wrong. It just, it's, mm -hmm. it's, that's just what the authors had to do to make uh, their gospel readable. All right. Thank you so much for that. Okay, so let's move on to the second category, which is the names, places, and genealogies. And by the way, guys, for those who are watching, we will not going to cover all the uh, the alleged Bible contradictions of uh, the book. But if you want to grab a copy, of course, uh, you will have access to uh, the listed 420 alleged Bible contradictions. So we will touch only uh, what is... You know what's what's the most famous uh, contradiction that uh, atheists and non non believing world you actually raised? So yeah, so let's move on and uh, go to the second category, which the name places in genealogy. So can you describe this particular section? Yeah, sometimes uh, uh, a name will be different. You know, they'll say X is the son of A, and then you read another section, X is the son of B. And in some cases, it's because a person has more than one name. And we have that, you know, today, people call me Jason, people call me Dr. Lyle. Uh, you know, some people are, are called by their name or they're called dad, you know, by their son or so on. And uh, so it's not really surprising that people have different names. A lot of times locations will have different names. They're called, you know, one name by one group or they're called another name, uh, Mount Sinai, Mount Horeb. Uh, sometimes a region is in including a larger region. And I think that's the case with Sinai. I have to, I think it's in the book anyway, but, you mm -hmm. know, Sinai might be a smaller region of Horeb, you know, or, uh, you know, Jerusalem, a part of Judea, Israel, and, and so on. So um, names, places, and genealogies where there's an apparent discrepancy in, in the name of something. Keep, but you, you got to keep in mind something can have more than one name. Locations, uh, the name can change with time. You know, some, some uh, a particular location might be in the, tr in the tribe of, Judah at one point and in a different tribe at another point in time because the boundaries have shifted. So that can happen as well. So there are a lot of reasons why we would expect if something is historically accurate that one person might be called by more than one name or a location might have more than one name or, or uh, the boundaries have changed with time. All of those are possibilities. All right. So we have here uh, in number 69, uh, who asked for the best seats in heaven? Uh, in Mark 10, 35, 37 says James and John. But in Matthew 20, uh, 20 to 21 says it was the mother of James and John. So what was it? Who yeah, was it? it's a bifurcation fallacy where you say either this or that. It was either these two or their mother. Why can't it be both? Mm -hmm. uh, one way in which... James and John could have asked Jesus is through their mother. They could say, "Hey, mom, uh, go talk to go talk to Jesus on our behalf," or, or perhaps she took the initiative. But in any case, you can ask somebody something directly, or you can ask them through an intermediary. You can ask somebody to ask on your behalf. Either mm -hmm. of those is acceptable. And and given the uh, what, what we what we understand about James and John, they might have done this more than once. They might have they might have yeah. asked on their own behalf one time, and they might have asked their mother on another occasion. That's certainly possible as well. So there's no contradiction here. It doesn't say that James and John asked, and then they didn't ask. That's not what it says. 
uh, they asked, and one text gives us additional information, they asked via their mother. Their mother asked on their behalf. That's perfectly acceptable. Mm. Mm. Okay. Interesting. <laughs> so uh, in number uh, on number 77, who killed Goliath? It was David, uh, according to Sam 1 Samuel 17:46 uh, to 51. And uh, but it was uh, Elhanan, according to 2 Samuel uh, 21st, uh, yeah, Second Samuel 21st, verse 19. Yeah, this is one where you actually have to go back and, and do a little bit of homework. This one's a little tricky because mm -hmm. the um, it, it, in the original text, uh, it, it's uh, Elhanan killed Lami, the brother of Goliath. But there are there are some minor textual variants there. So this mm -hmm. is one where you actually have to go back and uh, and do your homework on it. I had to do that. I had to go back and and look at that. There's um, we need we need to remember that the Bible has been delivered to us in history. It has been copied and errors have crept in in certain uh, versions. But here's the beautiful thing. Errors that creep in in one line uh, are not in another line. Another line will have a different set of errors. And so for that reason, yeah. we, can, we can reconstruct the original text. We know what it, we know what it says. Mm -hmm. And there's some places where there's, there's some minor doubts, but, but this is one of those cases where if you look at one line of transmission, there has been an error where, where a certain um, Hebrew, a couple of Hebrew terms have been contracted and it makes it look like um, Elhanan killed Goliath, but that's not what it says in the original, in the original text. He killed the brother of Goliath. Mm. That's what it says in the original text. Yeah. Okay. And uh, for those who are interested in reading uh, textual criticism, we have a lot of uh, sources. Uh, we have Dr. James White, who actually uh, is the leading apologist uh, in particular to that particular issue. Okay. So, hmm. Okay. Next, uh, let's go to the next uh, category. Uh, we have timings, uh, time, timing of events. Uh, can you tell us something about this particular section also? Yeah, well, people will say, well, you know, this text over here says that this event happened at this time. This other event over here says that the event happened at a different time. And, of course, you're mm -hmm. going to have to ask, is it the same event? That's one question to ask. Um, there are different methods of timekeeping that were used in the ancient world. And mm -hmm. so something can happen at uh, one time by Roman timekeeping and another time by Jewish timekeeping. They were different mm -hmm. in terms of when the day started. I think the Romans were more like us. Starting at midnight, the Jews uh, started the day at um, what sunset. But in terms of the way they counted the hours, they counted it from sunrise. So the third hour of the day would be three hours after sunrise by by a Jewish timekeeping, so about nine o'clock. And so there there are differences in the way that they keep time. And so you have to keep that in mind. Uh, it's not a contradiction to say something happened at one time by Jewish timekeeping and a different time by Roman timekeeping. Okay, so let's have uh, let's have one uh, number one hundred ten from your uh, book. Okay, when did Jesus ascended into heaven? Okay, uh, Luke twenty four uh, one verse fifty one and Mark sixteen uh, verses nine to nineteen contradict according to them. Contradict John twenty verse twenty six, uh, which also contradicts Acts thirteen thirty one. And which also contradicts Acts. This is uh, this is a very you know uh, a very bold claim about contradiction. But uh, did they really justify the contradiction? This is one where they just I don't think they've read the text carefully because yeah uh, Luke twenty four doesn't give the date of mm -hmm. uh, Christ's resurrection only that it was or of, of the ascension only that it was after the uh, resurrection after he led the disciples to uh, Bethany. Likewise, Mark doesn't give the uh, the time or date of, of Christ's ascension. So like, where are you getting this information? Um, again, only that it was sometime after the resurrection. All the Gospels agree on that. Um, it, and, of course, I, I do have to point out there is some uh, textual criticism that needs to be done in mm -hmm. uh, Mark 16. 9. I didn't point that out because it's not necessary because there, there is yeah. an apparent contradiction here. Um, let's see. Gospel of John, likewise, doesn't it doesn't mention the ascension, although obviously it would have to be after his resurrection, after the appearances. Mm -hmm. 
Acts states that it was that Jesus was seen for many days. So I, again, the critics here are just apparently not reading the text carefully, or perhaps it's just a bluff where they thought we wouldn't bother to read it carefully. But there, there isn't any contradiction. But all of them agree that the ascension happened sometime after the resurrection, but none of them really give a specific uh, date um, until we, well, we get to uh, Acts one two, uh, chapter one indicates that the time between Christ's resurrection and the ascension was at least forty days. Mm -hmm. But, but there's nothing that contradicts that. So none of these are giving a date that, that supposedly differs from another date. Yeah, I actually heard uh, from one of your interviews that uh, the, the list of the alleged Bible contradictions that you found was actually more than 420. Am I right? Yeah, it, the, the list was 439. And originally, I, I, originally this book had 439. But mm. uh, like seven, a lot of them were duplicates. Uh -huh. And and my and so I would just say, well, this is just the this is the same type of error. What like for example, the uh, the list of the number of people that came back from Babylon, yes. as listed in Ezra versus Nehemiah, the critic listed seventeen differences, but those are all one. They're one error on the critic's yeah. part. And also, so my publisher also, recommended collapsing that. Yeah. Also, they they, they brought up many times. Uh, in the in the event of Peter denying Jesus Christ, rooster crows, so on and so forth. Uh, I have read that uh, it occurs many times. So, so I eliminated uh, the duplications. And some mm -hmm. of them were back to back too, where they like twenty two, and then twenty three would be exactly the same. <laughs> like, come on, guys. <laughs> like, I mean, in high school, sometimes students would do that to make their essay look longer. They'd repeat. You know, they'd repeat. Mm, mm, yeah, yeah. I'm a, <laughs> yeah, I, I can actually relate to that. I'm a, I'm, I'm a senior high school uh, teacher, so I can relate to that when I, when I, when I give them uh, assignments, uh, essay. So yeah, they repeat words, phrases that have the same meanings. <laughs> yep. Okay, so let's have 133. Was Jesus crucified? the day before uh was was jesus crucified the day before or the day after the passover meal in this john is, 19 oh yeah, yeah this, is a, this is a tricky one this is a tricky one um this is what i would call the semantic anachronism fallacy and, mm -hmm. and a combination of um failure to read the text carefully jesus was crucified on the day of passover by jewish reckoning and and uh by the way the semantic anachronism fallacy is where we take a modern idea and try to force it back into an ancient text where they would have had a different, a slightly different meaning. The way mm -hmm. that the Jews uh, counted time was, uh, or in terms of the days, the, the new day starts at sunset. From our perspective, it starts at midnight, right? Midnight's when we say, okay, Monday becomes Tuesday. Mm -hmm. uh, it, the Jews at sunset, Monday becomes Tuesday. Mm -hmm. And so uh, Jesus was crucified on the day of Passover by Jewish reckoning because mm -hmm. He would have taken uh, Passover the previous evening by our standards, but after sunset. So it's, it counts as Passover already. Mm -hmm. And then some people apparently had yet to perform it. So they were still preparing the Passover for, because you, you had a rain, you had a, you had a day in which you could do it. And so there's no, uh, there's no contradiction here. You just need to understand the way that Jews keep time. Yeah. Uh, it, 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 yeah. The new day begins at sunset. Mm, okay. Okay. Thank you so much for that. And uh, let's go to the section uh, called cause and effect. Tell us something about this section. Uh, yeah. So again, um, I think the classic example is, is in the first uh, alleged contradiction in this category. 139 was Abraham justified, justified by faith or by works, which mm -hmm. what is the cause of Abraham's justification? And in that particular sense, it's a bifurcation fallacy because Abraham is justified by faith and by works. You need to understand that justification has it has a nuanced meaning. To justify uh, means to either be in the right or to demonstrate that you're in the right. And so if I try to justify myself, I'm trying to show that I'm in the right. And to be justified in the sense of being made right, that's accomplished solely by faith. Abraham believed God; it was credited to him as righteousness. So he is he is made right with God by his faith. But how does he demonstrate that to the world? How does Abraham demonstrate to the world 
that he has saving faith in God? And the answer is mm-hmm. by good works. Good works follow from saving faith. And so Abraham is justified before God by faith alone. He's justified before men by the works that follow from his faith. And that's the whole point of James uh, chapter two. It's distinguishing a said faith. Somebody says, I have, I have faith. Well, show me. How how can you show me your faith? God can Mm -hmm. see it. And so you're justified before God. But how are you justified before men? By the works Mm -hmm. that follow from saving faith. So that's an example of where somebody is claiming the cause of Abraham's faith is contradictory. Because in one sense, it's uh, the the, the cause of Abraham's righteousness is it or his justification. Is it by faith or is it by works? And the answer is it depends on who you're demonstrating it to. If you're demonstrating it to God, it's by faith alone. If you're demonstrating it to men, it's by the works that follow from that faith. All right. Thank you so much for that. Okay. Since you have already brought up uh, 139, okay, let's have 144. Um, who forces non-believers to disbelieve? In John 12, 40 and 2 Thessalonians 2, 11 to 12 indicate that God does. But in 2 Corinthians 4, 3 to 4 indicates that say that, uh, that it is Satan. So this is an example of um, people denying dual causality. Christians embrace dual causality. God does mm-hmm. things and he uses means to do it. And there's another example in this. Well, there, there are many other examples in, in Scripture, but one yeah. that comes to mind right away. And I'm sure this is in here somewhere, but um uh, Pharaoh, who caused Pharaoh to harden his heart? You read, you read some sections of scripture, Pharaoh hardened his heart. You read other sections, yeah. God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Why can't it be both? Why can't God help Pharaoh to do what Pharaoh wanted to do anyway? And uh, God will do that. People who hate God and spit in his face and hate him and, and, uh, and they harden their heart against him, God will help them to do what they want to do. People blind their own eyes and God blinds their eyes. And God even uses Satan as a causal agent in some instances to do what to, to help people do what they want to do anyway. So uh, p- people who say, well, there's just one true cause for something. They don't know what they're talking about because in, in even in science, we understand multiple causation. You have mm-hmm. uh, proximate causes, you have distal causes. And I always think of billiards. When I, when I think of cause and effect, I think of a pool table, right? And so this ball causes that ball to move when it impacts, mm-hmm. but what caused that ball to move? Well, the guy with the cue stick. And so what's the cause of the motion of the, of the, of the, the eight ball in the corner pocket. Is it the cue ball that hit it? Well, yes. Or is it the, the guy who hit the, the cue ball? Or is it the fact that he showed up that day to play pool? All of those yeah. are factors. All of those are the cause. Uh, there's not just one cause for something. So exactly. yes, God can blind people's eyes. People blind their own eyes and Satan can blind people's eyes. There's no, there's no, there's no contradiction there. Amazing. And uh, mo- most atheists actually, you know, uh, think of that as an, as a very, ugly, ugly uh, thing that God can actually do. Uh, if, if God is all loving, I mean, this is not indicated in your book, but if God is all loving, how can he harden uh, someone's heart for him to not believe, but he calls every person to believe? So why is yeah. that the case? Yeah, people get upset by that, but you need to remember, mm-hmm. God doesn't take somebody who loves him and says, oh, I want to worship God, and, and harden that person's heart. God doesn't do that. Mm-hmm. The people that God hardens their heart are people that harden their own hearts. And in fact, I just realized it's the next it's the next one on the list, 145, yeah. uh, who hardened Pharaoh's heart, where the critic says, you know, wh- which is it? Is it God or is it Pharaoh? And the answer is both. There is nothing unjust or unloving about God helping someone to do what they want to do anyway. Mm-hmm. Somebody says, I hate God. <laughs> I don't want to see him. God says, that's fine. I'll help you. I'll close your eyes. God mm-hmm. will do that. There's nothing unjust about that. And praise God, God doesn't fully honor people's uh, wishes to hate him, and or otherwise none of us would be saved because we're, we, we all are born in sin, hating God, spitting in his face, um, mocking yeah. his law in, in rebellious treason against the king of kings. God takes some of us and turns our hearts around to love him. Others, he helps them to do what they want to do. Now, how can you complain if God helps you to do what you want to do? There's no logical basis for that. Exactly. Thank you so much for that. Okay, so, okay, so, the, the, yeah, the next number after 145, we have number 46 here. Who sent, okay, who sent the Holy Spirit? Uh, Jesus did so according to John for uh, John 15, 26, but God the Father did so according to John 14, 26. 
And this one's particularly embarrassing because if anyone knows anything <laughs> about the Trinity, uh, I mean, the answer is God sent the Holy Spirit. And is it God the Father, God the Son? The answer is yes. God the Father sent the Holy Spirit. God the Son sent, sent the Holy Spirit. The, the three persons of the Trinity cooperate in salvation. It's, it, it's the same. Um, I'm sure it's in here somewhere, but who, who raised Jesus from the dead? Jesus talked about, you know, I lay my life down. I take it up again. Sounds like Jesus raised himself from the dead. Or did the Father raise him from the dead? Or was he quickened by the Spirit? Was it the Holy Spirit that raised him from the dead? And the answer is yes. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit raised Jesus from the dead. There's no problem. The three persons of the Trinity cooperate in salvation and in many other aspects, including the giving of the Holy Spirit. God the Father and God the Son give the Holy Spirit. Yeah, and the thing is, unbelieving worldview, at least uh, most of them, are not uh, taking any effort to understand the doctrine of the Trinity when they criticize the Christian worldview, right? Oh, it's very common. Yeah, it's very common. I, 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 I I don't think I've ever heard a criticism of the Trinity that was actually accurate. I'm sure that I'm, I'm sure there are some, perhaps in, in some of the more ancient literature, where the Church Fathers um, have argued against a true conception of the Trinity. But everyone I've heard has been like, "Well, you you believe in three gods? No, we don't believe in three gods. There's yeah. one God. There are three persons in the Trinity. But but see, you're you're well, you have multiple gods. No, that's not." <laughs> That's not what we're saying. Uh, God is one in nature or essence. He's three in persons. And people say, well, I can't picture that. I can't picture it either. But who are we to de defy what God has said about himself? God's in an infinite being. I can't even imagine how that works. But uh, we have to trust what God has said about his own nature because he, he is beyond the limitations of our finite comprehension. But there's nothing illogical about the Trinity. And again, that's another one. We'll say, see, you're contradicting yourself. God is one in these three. Yeah. He's not one in three in the same sense. He's one in the sense of being or essence. He's three in the sense of persons who act as witnesses and independent witnesses for that for that matter. So there's no contradiction in saying God is one in being, three in persons. You say, but what else in nature has that? Nothing. God, God, the Trinity is unique. It's unique to God. I can show you things that are similar in some respects to the Trinity. Uh, the church is one church. It's many persons. So there's a one in many. But that doesn't quite, it's not quite the same as the Trinity because not each yeah, person of yeah. the church is fully the church, whereas each person of the Godhead is fully God. So yeah. it's, it doesn't quite work. But there are things in nature that are one in one sense and more than one in another sense. And we'd expect that because that follows from God, who is uh, one in essence or being and three in persons. Yeah. And I actually remembered uh, John Lennox's dialogue with Richard Dawkins uh, since. Uh, Richard Dawkins, of course, uh, reject the idea of doctrine of the Trinity, and uh, John Lennox actually asked uh, Richard Dawkins, uh, "What is an what is energy?" And suddenly, Dawkins answered, "I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I, I, uh, we, we can study it, but I don't know what is it." So you believe in energy, but you don't know what is energy, and uh, uh, where, where in the Christian world we believe the Trinity, we just you know, can uh, even though there is a difficulty or a mystery beyond understanding what the Trinity is, then you call that absurd. But in fact, uh, we ask you about what energy is. You don't know what it is, but you believe it. So, yeah, what, what's your take on that particular uh, discussion? <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of things like that that are hard to define. We sort of have, we sort of have, I mean, we deal, physicists, we deal with energy all the time. And it's a little bit harder to define. At least it's harder to find in a way that's not circular because uh, energy is the potential to do, it, energy is either work or the potential to do work. But what is work? You know, and so on. Or, or the, the thing, uh, another one that's, that's a classic is how do you define mass? And mass is a resistance to acceleration under a force. What's a force? Well, force is the thing that, that causes mass to accelerate. Mm -hmm. and I don't know how to define one without the other. And yet we, it's, it's still useful. So yeah. there are some things that that God has has given us that we that we sort of understand, but we, we can't give a complete explanation of it. There's there's partial understanding, and that's certainly true in science. I don't know how you can deny that. There are a lot of things in science that are difficult to define. Even consciousness. How do you define consciousness without using a synonym of consciousness? Well, it's to be self-aware. Well, that's another way of saying consciousness. Uh, <laughs> we sort of know what it is though, because we experience it. And so, uh, yeah, we shouldn't be bothered by the fact that there are some things that are difficult to define. The Trinity, I don't think, is difficult to define, though. It's just difficult to understand. And there are things that yeah. are difficult to understand in nature. That's okay, though. That doesn't make them false. That just means our minds are finite. That's not a problem, exactly. logically. 
Yep, exactly. And thank you so much for that. All right, so let's move on and uh, let's go to describe. Uh, yeah, details. Uh, no differences in details. So uh, could you describe this section? Yeah, it's again, it's just uh, one, one account, perhaps in the Gospels, gives certain details. Another account gives different details, and people sometimes assume those are contradictory, but they're not. They're complementary. Mm -hmm. And so one person sees a car accident and says, yeah, the car that was in that accident, man, it was going fast. Mm -hmm. And another person sees the same accident and says, yeah, the car that caused that accident was red. Now, that's a difference in detail, but it's not a contradiction because, a, a, you know, a red car can be fast. There's no there's no problem with that. And in the Gospels, a lot of times we'll see differences that we'll see different authors record different details. We would expect that. Uh, each one of them has a particular emphasis in the gospel that that they're uh, pushing forward, and that's that's fine. Mm -hmm. um, but different eyewitnesses will record different details. Unless those details are actual contradictions, you don't have a problem. If somebody yeah. said the car that caused the accident was um, black, and another one said no, it's uh, green and that doesn't have any black on it at all, then then you'd have a problem. But that's not what we see in the differences that we see in the in the gospels, for example. Okay, and uh, I have a good thing that you you put this on your book. Uh, I actually had uh, watched a particular podcast that brought up Joshua ten when 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 the the sun stood still. Okay, and uh, their explanation about this is uh, their their analogy is when you are inside a moving truck, for example, or a moving car, and you suddenly stop a moving car, what will happen? So you can, you actually uh, force yourself to, you know, and, uh, and uh, if, if that's going to happen, well, uh, the rotation of the earth is faster than the moving car. So why is it that, you know, uh, things happen uh how, how do we explain these things yeah why, why doesn't everybody go flying off the earth when god stopped yeah. the earth <laughs> gosh it was long day uh this one's particular <laughs> i don't know I, I find this particularly silly because I, I have to ask well what mechanism did god use to stop the earth did, i mean did he physically grab it you know and <laughs> well no, <laughs> let let the angular momentum of the earth be zero um I, god just decreed it and it happened now do you think it's reasonable to think that God could stop every atom of the earth and forget to stop the atoms on the earth's surface so that they continue to fly forward at 700 miles per hour at this latitude? I mean, that's just ridiculous, isn't that's it? That's hilarious, man. Yeah. I mean, if God's going to stop the earth, he's going to stop everything on it, too. That's not a problem for God. He just sets the angular momentum of everything to be zero for a short period of time and then starts it up again afterwards. It's funny, yeah. too, because I... I uh, <laughs> I had a I had a um, secular journalist one time interviewing me. I was in my office and I had my I had my computer simulation going where it shows the solar system and it had the Earth rotating. And he said, "How did how did God stop the Earth and everybody flying off?" And I said, "Like this." And I hit a button and the Earth stopped in my <laughs> you know and no, nothing went flying off because I mm -hmm. I I stopped my simulation. Mm -hmm. Why can't God stop His? I mean, it makes no sense whatsoever to think that God would somehow forget about the atoms on the surface of the earth, which are a small fraction of the atoms mm -hmm. of the earth, but he'd stop every other atom. It makes no sense whatsoever. An infinite God has no problem stopping the earth and everything on it for a short period of time. God can suspend laws of physics. Uh, they're, they're his anyway. Yeah. So it's not really a problem. <laughs> yeah. And it makes sense in the Christian worldview because we have a God that can actually, oh, the God that that made uh, the universe, uh uh, can actually do that since uh, he is all powerful and of course the source of this creation so yeah it makes sense in the christian worldview and of course we don't expect that it will make sense in the non-believing worldview most especially in the materialistic kind of worldview right yeah okay so hmm, okay we have here 254 who wrote the pentateuch uh, Deuteronomy 1, verse 1, 31. Uh, yeah, Deuter Deuteronomy 1, verse 1, and uh, chapter 31, verse 9 says that Moses did, which contradicts 
Numbers 12, verse 3, and Deuteronomy 34, verse 5, so on and so forth. Yeah, th there's nothing that, um, I mean, Moses wrote the Pentateuch. Jesus affirms that in the New Testament. There's nothing mm -hmm. that contradicts that. The other texts that the critic cites, one of them is talking about Moses in the third person. You can do that. You can write a book where you talk about yourself in the third person. That's not a problem. Mm -hmm. uh, so that doesn't, it's not saying that Moses didn't write it. And I suppose the critics bothered by the fact that the, um, the last little section of Deuteronomy um, records the death of Moses. And so people mm -hmm. are bothered by that. Uh, I, I, it's not a problem at all. I think the most likely explanation is that, that Joshua finished the end of the book. But it's still appropriate to say that Moses wrote Deuteronomy because he wrote the bulk of it. And, you know, what if somebody comes along and adds a little, you know, epitaph at the end uh, telling how Moses died? That's not a problem. And frankly, since it's a supernaturally inspired book, it is possible that Moses wrote about his own death uh, in mm -hmm. advance. That's certainly possible. But I think it's most likely that Joshua just finished the book. People expect a modern level of precision, I think, or a modern a, a, a modern way of thinking about things where, mm -hmm. you know, in, in modern times, if you, if you, anybody helps you with a book, you better give them a footnote uh, or, at least, or say that you co-authored it. But that's not the biblical system. If somebody wrote the vast majority of a book, then that person wrote the book. That would be the way you would say it in the ancient world. So mm -hmm. there's nothing in the Bible that says Moses did not write the Pentateuch, nothing. And so there isn't, there's no contradiction here. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, and the last section will be yes or no. Uh, yeah, can you tell us a bit about uh, what's with this section? Yeah, it's just uh, this would be the ones that would be the most devastating to the Christian worldview if they were true, because this is where the mm. critic is alleging that one verse is is uh, answering a specific question, yes, and another verse is answering the very same question in the same sense at the same time, no. And so this these, this would be the section. This would be the really the only section. Where if we had, uh, if we had a genuine conflict, it would actually be a contradiction. It's not just mm -hmm. different details included and things like that. So this is potentially the most devastating section, and yet we don't find any genuine contradictions here either. Okay, so let's have number two hundred uh, two hundred ninety nine. Should you answer a fool, and uh, I really, really love this verse, but uh, however unbelieving worldview take this verse out of context, or they just don't understand this particular verse. Okay. Uh, Proverbs 26, uh, verse 5 and 4. Should you answer a fool according to his folly? Uh, Proverbs 26, uh, verse 5 says yes, and Proverbs 26, verse 4 says no. That would be devastating if the context were the same, but the context is not the same. And in yeah. fact, each verse gives the context, right? Proverbs 26, 4, uh, do not answer a fool according to his folly, lest you be like him. So verse 4 is telling us you shouldn't, you shouldn't actually embrace the standards of the fool or you'll be like him. Mm -hmm. now that, is that what verse 20 is? Is verse 5 then saying answer, do answer the fool according to his folly and you'll be like him. That's not what it says. It says, answer the fool according to his folly so that he will not be wise in his own eyes. That's a different sense, and it's very specific. You, you need to answer the fool in such a way that he, that he sees his own folly. You answer him according to his own folly to expose his own folly, not, but not in the sense of becoming like him. And so I think it's actually very clear. Verse 4 yeah. is saying when somebody comes to you and they have a foolish presupposition, they have a worldview that's contrary to Scripture, don't embrace that or you'll be like him. On the other hand, you should show the critic where that goes. You should pretend to be the critic for the sake of argument to show that his worldview is inconsistent with itself. And so, for example, if somebody came to you and said, um, everything that exists in the universe is just matter and energy, and you, you believe in this immaterial God, there's no such thing as the immaterial. Be logical for heaven's sake. I would say to that, you know, am I gonna embrace that standard according to Proverbs 26, four? I'm not gonna embrace that standard if I said, oh, okay, I'll show you that God exists, but I'll accept your your definitions. I'll accept your premise that material only material things exist. No, I'm not going to do that because if I did, I'd be like him. On the other mm -hmm. hand, I would say, but hypothetically, if only material things existed, you couldn't use laws of logic because they are not material. You mm -hmm. can't stub your toe on a law of logic. It's a they're conceptual rules of reasoning. Yeah. And so what I'm going to do, you see, I'm, I'm not going to embrace his ridiculous materialistic standard but I am going to show where it would go if it were true so that he can't be wise in his own eyes. That's a great example of where mm -hmm. I've, I've not answered the full according to his folly 
in the sense of becoming like him, but I have answered the fool according to his folly to, uh, to expose his inconsistency so that he can't be wise in his own eyes. So the, these verses give the context and the context is different in the two verses. Right. Thank you so much for that. And th that's actually one of our charter verse of presuppositionalism, right? <laughs> it is. Yeah. Okay. And uh, let's have here, uh, is it okay for men to have long hair? Uh, number six, uh, verse five in Judges 13. And Give the uh, number for that one, sorry. Uh, Yeah, 300, 348. Okay. We're jumping yeah. ahead a little bit. That's fine. Okay. Is it okay for men to have long hair? Oh, and uh, yeah, that's the question. Yeah, it's, uh, it, it's not if you're fulfilling the Nazarite vow. And the, the the whole point of that the Nazarite vow is you um, you become you become miserable for a while you for, you give up everything for the sake of God for a period of time, and in in that period of time you don't cut your hair, uh, you don't do the things that you would normally do to to be well groomed and so on. Uh, it's mm -hmm. for a period of time. There's no verse that teaches otherwise. Um, and again, First Corinthians eleven fourteen. It's not saying that it's uh, sinful, but it is a dishonor or shame to him to have long hair. And that's, that's, that was the point of the Nazarite vow. You, you, you take on your, your own shame. It's, it's a, it was a, a temporary um, vow that you would make for a period of time to try and draw closer to God by recognizing your own shame, by recognizing your own dishonor. Uh, but it was for a period of time. And so again, this is an example of uh, 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 a person who is, exposing his own humiliation. You don't mm -hmm. want to do that forever, but for a period of time to get close with God, separate yourself from other people, that's fine. So uh, yeah, there's nothing wrong with having context. Yeah, yeah. It, it, context is what it makes all the difference in the world. So this is an example where the critic has failed to read the text carefully, really. Yeah, and I think uh, most of the critics of the Bible actually uh, do the same thing over and over again. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So let's entertain some questions from our audience. And uh, I, don't, uh, I think it's not uh, in the book, but uh, I think you can, you can answer this. Um, let's have, okay. Was the pyramid built before or after the flood? <laughs> yeah, it would be after the flood. Uh, that bothers some people because the, the um, Egyptian, uh, some of the Egyptian records, depending on how you read them, would put the date back before what we would consider to be the flood year. But that's because we now understand that some of those Egyptian dynasties that people assumed were consecutive, one happening after the other, were actually concurrent. At least they overlapped. And so that reduces the time scale a bit. David Downs wrote a wonderful article on this called Searching for Moses that I would highly mm -hmm. recommend that you read. The pyramids would have to be after the flood because the flood would have destroyed them. It would have utterly destroyed them. So uh, any any man-made structure, I don't think you're going to find any man-made structure that survives the flood. Uh, it, it, we might someday find buried deep in flood sediments some structure, but it's certainly not going to be on the surface, right? So, you know, the, the pyramids are built atop flood sediments. So the pyramids were after the worldwide flood. Okay. Thank you so much for that. Let's have another question. Uh, thank you, Dr. Lyle. I have two questions. Uh, one, does Genesis 6 3 contradict uh, Psalm 90 about uh, human longevity and uh, what makes logical fallacies uh, a fallacy? <laughs> okay, for the first, uh, Genesis 6 3, if I'm not mistaken, that's where uh, God promises that man's days would be 120 years. A lot of people assume that that means a, uh, that the lifespan of man would be limited to 120 years. I don't think that's the right interpretation of that passage because even after that pronouncement, People did live to be long. Even Abraham lived to be, you know, 200 years old or something like that. He lived longer than 120, uh, 120 years. I think what that's saying there in Genesis chapter six is that the amount of time that God get when God saw the wickedness of mankind and it had become so great, he says, "That's it. I'm going to give them 120 years to repent. And after that, I'm going to wipe them out." So it's the time. It's the time between when God sees the wickedness of mankind and decides to destroy mankind. That's the interval of grace, 120 years to repent. They didn't, and so he destroyed the earth, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. So that's that's what the 120 years refers to. And then Psalm 90, I, if I'm not mistaken, Mo, is a psalm of Moses uh, where he records that man's days would be something like 70 years, if by strength of power, perhaps 80 years. Um, and that's giving a generalization. 
It's not saying that that is an absolute upper limit for human lifespan. It's giving a typical lifespan. And that is, that's about right. We, we do a little better today because of modern advances in medicine, but um, it's giving the typical lifespan at that time. And by the way, even if you did think that Genesis 6-3 was referring to age, two different times, right? If mm -hmm. People can live longer at one period of time, and then they can live a shorter lifespan at a different period of time. So it wouldn't be a contradiction, even if you interpreted the, it the other way. And then uh, what makes logical fallacies fallacy? Uh, <laughs> fallacy is an error in reasoning. That's all it is. It's an error in reasoning. Mm -hmm. So if something is a fallacy if um, you can if you draw a conclusion that does not follow from the premises, or if the premises are self-refuting or self you know contradictory. That's you know ultimately something's a fallacy if it is contrary to the way that God thinks. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay, another inquiry we have here. Uh, is it available in Philippines, Dr. Lyle? I, I don't know. We do ship to, uh, we, we ship out of the out of the States though. So, mm -hmm. and I realize it's a little more expensive that way. Um, you could try through Amazon maybe, I don't know. You could try it, but but certainly we'll ship it to you. If you, if you go through our website, we can ship to the Philippines. It's not a problem. Um, maybe buy a bulk of them and, and Start your own little bookstore there. Who knows? <laughs> We'd be happy to send it to you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much for that information. And uh, let's have Aaron. See, uh, I don't think if this is still related, but yeah, uh, I have a question. This is quite personal. Uh, are we allowed to have tattoos and smoke? Or are Christians allowed to have tattoos and smoke? Uh, I saw Joe Horn. Okay. Ooh, I'm going to get in trouble for this one. Oh my! <laughs> uh, there is an Old Testament scripture that talks about you shouldn't get a tattoo. I think it's Leviticus uh, 19:28, if I'm not mistaken. You'll want to research that verse, uh, and you'll need to decide if that's something that would uh, continue to apply in the New Testament. And to be honest with you, I'm not 100% sure. I'm not 100% sure. Um, I err on the safe side. I'm, I don't have any tattoos. I'm not going to get any. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's something to think about too. Is suppose you come to the conclusion that yeah, that's 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 part of the ceremonial law of the Old Testament, and it may be, and so that's something that's not binding on New Testament Christians, like eating shrimp, right? They weren't allowed to eat shrimp in the Old Testament, but you are in the New New Testament because that represented the separation of Israel as God's chosen people, and that separation is done away with in the New Testament, and so the dietary restrictions that were imposed only on Israel are not binding on New Testament Christians. And so you might say tattoos fall under that category, and they might. Uh, then you then you need to decide it's a wisdom issue then. It yeah. is, is the benefit of getting this tattoo, you say, okay, I'm, I'm clear biblically, it's not a sin, is it wise? And one thing I would just, just to give you something to think about, will it enhance your testimony or damage it? Because somebody who, maybe who's completely covered with tattoos and, uh, it, 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 does that person look like a Christian? And again, that's something you're going to have to decide. That's something you're going to have to pray about and think about and search the scriptures for yourself. Uh, likewise, smoking. Uh, I can't think of any particular verse that forbids smoking, but it is a wisdom issue. We know that smoking is damaging to your health. And yeah. so I, I think it's, I think it's unwise to smoke given what we now know about it. And, and again, some people are addicted. They say, I can't give it up. I get it. I understand. Uh, and there, there were great theologians of the past. I mean, Spurgeon loved his, he loved his pipe. And, uh, <laughs> but then again, I, I don't know yeah, that they knew that. about the health, um, uh, problems that that caused at that time in history. So I, so with both of those issues, I think they're wisdom issues with tattoos. You need to search the study, the context of that, decide if it's a ceremonial law or a moral principle that would still be binding where we shouldn't look like the world, for example. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and in both issues, certainly, uh, you'll have to pray about it. I'm not going to make a dogmatic statement about either of those. There, yes. I have brothers in Christ that are tattooed, and I love them, and they're sanctified, and that's great. Uh, but give it some thought as to whether or not that's going to benefit your evangelistic outreach or harm it. All right. Thank you so much for that answer. And another question from Aaron once again. Also, are Nephilims were real? Oh, okay, so let's define our terms. What are Nephilims, uh, Dr. Lyle? Yeah, there, it's a term. It's a Hebrew term. It's used in Genesis chapter six to refer to um, the when the sons of God took wives from the daughters of men, 
and they bore offspring. Apparently, Nephilim refers to those offspring. It's sometimes translated as giants, but that's not necessarily a correct translation. It's related to the Hebrew word. The Hebrew word Nephilim is related to the Hebrew word to fall. So Nephilim might mean the fallen ones. And some people think in Genesis 6 that refers to fallen angels. I don't take that position myself. Mm -hmm. uh, I think they're, they're assuming that the sons of God are angels and the daughters of men are humans, angels somehow reproducing with humans. Uh, I don't think that's a biblical theme, though. It, it, yeah. in, in Scripture, organisms reproduce according to their kind. And so two organisms have to be the same kind if they're going to reproduce. And we are not the same kind as angels. They are spiritual beings. They're not physical. Uh, yeah. Some people say, well, it's angels taking human bodies. I, I, I lean against that as well. Sons of God is, however, used to refer to Christians. We know that in the New Testament. And even in the, even in the Old Testament, uh, the word sons uh, is sometimes used for men. So men of God would be sons of God. Uh, I think what's happening in Genesis 6 is that you're having uh, believers, godly men, who are marrying ungodly women. And that is something that the Bible uh, says you're not supposed to do that. We find that explicitly in the New Testament. But the principle's always been there. What fellowship does light have with darkness? And uh, when you do that, the children apparently fell away from the faith. So I think that's why it's re they're referred to as Nephilim is they fell away from the uh, faith. And then the same term is used in some cases of the of the Philistines. And, and that's why people think it's giants, because uh, uh, Goliath was one of these Nephilim, apparently. But that just means that uh, he's one of the fallen ones. The Philistines had also fallen away from the, from the faith. Mm. They were not uh, servants of the living God. Okay, so there you go, Aaron. <laughs> okay, let's have from... Uh, there's no name here, but <laughs> a nickname, post Nebras looks. <laughs> Is it okay for Christians to believe in old creationism? I think it's a rhetorical, rhetorical question. Uh, yeah, it's not. It's, uh, it's not. It doesn't, it, doesn't it doesn't challenge your salvation because, of course, we can believe in wrong. We can believe in things that are false yeah. and still be saved by God's grace. Praise God for that. We can have it, We can have problems in our theology to a certain extent. And still be saved. Obviously, if your theology is so bad, you don't know who God is, you can't be saved. But uh, we can have mistakes in reasoning. The problem with the old earth creationism view is almost all versions of it have death before sin. If you, if you believe that the fossils are hundreds of millions of years old, we all agree human beings don't go back hundreds of millions of years. Even the secularists will admit that human beings are recent. Okay, So if you have death before human beings existed, that means you have death before Adam sinned. And if you have death before Adam sinned, that means that his sin was not what brought death into the world. And that, mm -hmm. that contradicts a lot of scriptures, not just in Genesis, but it's repeated again in Romans, 1 Corinthians 15. It's by one man came death. Uh, so death came into the world as a result of Adam's sin. People try to explain that away. They'll say, well, I think it's just human death. I don't think you can defend that scripturally because Romans 8 yeah. tells us that all creation groans under this bondage of corruption that was introduced because of Adam's sin. So when you see a fossil that's a dead organism, that had to have happened after Adam sinned, and therefore it can't be millions of years old because we all agree human beings don't go back that far. So that's one of the that's one of the theological reasons why you don't want to believe in an old Earth, an Earth that's billions of years old. Of course, the Earth is old; it's about six thousand years old. That's quite old, actually, if you think about it. But um, in, there, it, in contrast to the billions of years, it's quite young. And, of course, exegetically, when you study the text of Genesis, there's no doubt that God really did create in six days. It's clear from context. Those are days. People say, oh, those could be long periods of time. No, they can't. Not in the mm -hmm. context of Genesis. Because each one of them is bounded by an evening and a morning. There's a number with each one of them. And that's, that always indicates ordinary days in all the historical narrative sections of the Bible. When you have the Hebrew word for day, yom, used with, you know, evening and more, bound by evening and morning and used in a, in a sequence like that. And Exodus 20 makes it very explicit. Exodus 20, beginning in verse 8, tells us that our work week, the reason we have a seven-day week, God specifies you work six days, you rest one. And then he gives the reason why in verse 11, because that's how he did it. And it uses the same word for day in the plural form, yamim, which is always uh, ordinary days. Yamim never means a long period of time or anything like that. So, uh, yeah, there's no doubt that the world's young, according to Scripture. Yep. And I would recommend you watch... Uh, the dialogue with Dr. Jason Lyle with uh, Hugh Ross um, on the YouTube channel of Eli Ayala, uh, Revealed Apologetics. You might want to watch or check that out.
Okay, so uh, how about uh, being a theistic evolutionist? Uh, uh, is it okay if I'm a Christian, then I believe in uh, theory of evolution? Same problem. If, you, if you're a Christian and you believe in evolution, um, you have death before sin. The, the idea of evolution is the strong dominate over the weak and kill them off. It's, it's fueled by death. And so if human beings came about by a process of death and suffering, then uh, you have death before Adam sinned. In, in which case, death is not the penalty for sin. And if death's not the penalty for sin, why did Jesus die on the cross? The whole gospel just doesn't make sense yeah. if you embrace either old earth creationism or theistic evolution. I think the problem the problems get even worse if you embrace theistic evolution because then we're we're related to animals, and that's a problem because uh, you know the Bible says in Hebrews ten four that the blood of bulls and goats cannot take away sins. Why is that? Because yeah. we're not related to them. That's why yeah. it had to be a man. And it had to be God for to pay an infinite penalty. So that's why that's why Jesus is the God man. That's why he came to earth to pay for our sins. He's our blood relative. And according to scripture, only a relative can redeem you. That's an important aspect of Old Testament law, the, the uh, kinsman redeemer, the concept of the kinsman redeemer. But you see, if, if evolution is true, then we are related to bulls yeah. and goats. Why can't they take away our sin? It, that, that go the gospel is just gone. It doesn't make any sense if you embrace old earth creationism or theistic evolution. Now, granted, people can be inconsistent. People can be saved by God's grace and still have inconsistencies in their thinking. I'm just pointing out it doesn't make any sense. It's not yeah. logical to believe in old earth creationism or in theistic evolution and also believe in the gospel because those are contrary to each other. All right. Thank you so much for that. I remember uh, Ray Comfort's interview with an, with a particular uh, person who believes in evolution. So you're related to bananas? Because <laughs> yeah. Ray Comfort were, uh, was called Banana Man. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, he's got an interesting uh, video on that topic. I, I have a lot of respect for Ray Comfort. He's, he's a great guy. And, a, and yeah. A, just Amazing. a fine Christian. I really respect him. Yeah. All right. Um, another question here, not related to, uh, by, uh, to your book, but, uh, I think, uh, related to objections, uh, uh, from our atheist friends. Why did God allow the entrance of evil if he is all knowing and all powerful? Yeah. I haven't asked you yet about this, uh, problem of evil thing. I think that, uh, Paul actually answers that question. The apostle Paul under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit in Romans nine, he poses it as a hypothetical, but I think he's actually giving the answer. He's saying, what if God allowed all these vessels of destruction, all these people that he that he knew he would condemn to hell? Uh, why, why, what if he allowed that evil in the world so that he could show his grace and his mercy to, uh, to, to the vessels that he chose? And so Paul brings up this issue. God, God's unfair. He can't, he, you know, why, why does he allow evil? Well, first of all, he's God. He can do what he wants. Uh, you can't say the potter. The clay can't say to the potter, why have you made me this way? But Paul then asks that hypothetical question. What if, what if God allowed these instruments, these vessels of destruction so that he could show his grace to vessels of mercy? Uh, if you think about it, and if Adam and Eve had never sinned, and let's say no human beings following through, they, you know, their children were perfect and so on, and none of us had ever sinned. I mean, that'd be great. We would know God's love. We would know his um the, we would we would owe him our existence as he is our creator we're the creation but we would not know anything about god's mercy and grace mm -hmm. we would never know god's mercy and grace we'd never know that we'd never know about the fact that he can forgive sins we'd never know the extent that he loves us that he was willing to take on sins uh, on our behalf so that's something to think about god has a morally commendable reason for the evil that he allows in this world. And we see, we see examples of that in the old Testament where, uh, you know, Joseph um, was, uh, you know, taken captive into Egypt and he, he was not treated fairly and his brothers did not treat him fairly. And yet God used that injustice to bring physical salvation to their family to, you know, because they, there was the famine and they came to Joseph and he was able to provide for them because of the injustice that was, that happened. And the ultimate example of that is Jesus Christ who uh, was on the cross. And he's the only person that didn't deserve the mm -hmm. horrible death that he received. He's the only person, all the rest of us, we die. It doesn't matter how horrible your death is. You, you deserved it. You've deserved yeah. worse. You deserve an eternal death. Uh, Jesus didn't. And that, that was a terrible injustice. Jesus was murdered. He was executed in an illegal 
trial. He was found innocent at the trial and executed anyway. Uh, how ridiculous is that? That's unjust. And God used that to save all of his people. That's Amen. awesome. He showed Amen. his mercy and grace uh, to his to his people by allowing that evil to occur. Yeah, that's actually why I really love the question, the problem of evil, because this actually, uh, this question actually take me to the cross. It does. Uh, in order for me to answer this question, uh, it actually allows me to go back to what Jesus Christ did on the cross and uh, present the gospel. Yes. So <laughs> this is actually one of the wonderful questions. I, I should want. add, too, that this question is meaningless apart from the Christian worldview. In an atheistic Amen. universe, there's no such thing as good and evil. The question mm -hmm. presupposes the truth of the Christian worldview. Because in, in an atheistic universe, you can say, what that person did displeases me. But there's no there's no objective basis for what you should or should not do if we're just chemical accidents, right? Exactly. I mean, you can get away with something, get away with it. Why not? There's no objective basis for morality in an atheistic worldview. In the Christian worldview, there is, uh, and that basis is God, God's commands, and you'll, you'll be judged by God's commands. So we have a very good reason to obey them. In the atheistic universe, if you can get away with something, why not? We're just fizzing chemicals. What one chemical accident does to another is morally irrelevant. So I, mm -hmm. I, I like the question because it demonstrates the truth of the Christian worldview. It's answerable within the Christian worldview. It's not a problem. Uh, mm -hmm. God has a morally commendable reason for the evil that he allows to take place yep. in this world. And he's given us several examples. You say, but what about this specific example? Why did my, why did my dad die from cancer or whatever? God's not required to give us a specific answer for each one. He's not, he, he's, he, he's not the servant. We're the servants. We answer to him. He doesn't answer to us. But he yeah. has given us several examples in Scripture, not the least of which is Jesus Christ, of course, of, of an evil that God used to accomplish a much greater good. Amen. All right. Okay, let's have, okay, never mind of the name. Is it possible uh, the Isaiah 6-2 is like the angel Gabriel appeared to Mary and Elizabeth? Let me look it up. Uh, Isaiah... Six, verse two. So it's the seraphim. Okay, so for context, verse one, in the king in the year of uh, King Uzziah's death, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, lofty and exalted, with the train of his robe filling the temple. Very famous verse there. Seraphim yeah. above him, each having six wings. Uh, with two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, with two he and with two he flew. Uh, so it's referring to, a, a seraphim, I believe, are referring to a special class of angels and uh, these particular seraphim, they, they surround God all the time and, and praise him all the time. Six-winged angels, apparently, kind of interesting. Um, is it possible that that is like the angel Gabriel? Uh, I don't think Gabriel's ever referred to as a seraphim. I'm not sure that he's in that category. I guess he could be. But these particular, I think these are a different class of angel than Gabriel. Mm -hmm. Gabriel's one that God used to communicate to human beings, uh, to Mary, for example. Whereas these seraphim are, uh, we, we find in other verses that they, they they surround God at all times. And holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I think they're a different. I think they're a different class of angel. Okay. By the way, are you still fine? It's already uh, I think nine fourteen over there. <laughs> uh, no, ten. Ten fourteen. <laughs> yeah. You're still fine. Minutes, if you like. Okay. Let's entertain some questions. Okay, John Wendell. Well, there, Jordan, three questions. <laughs> so you really love Great Dr. Jason Lyle. So what are your thoughts on Aaron Ra? Uh, <laughs> I've, seen some, <laughs> I've seen some of the stuff he's posted. I don't take it seriously, to be honest. Um, yeah. It, yeah, I, he's not, he's not, he's not, it, he doesn't practice good scholarship. Let's put it that way. Um, I'd be happy to answer some of the specific claims if you have one that you've thought of that he's or something that he's brought up. I'd be happy to answer that. But uh, yeah, I've seen some of his little splashes on there. He he doesn't like God. Okay, we get it, but that's that's irrelevant. <laughs> yeah, I think you have already answered uh, Genesis six three. Okay, yeah, that's already done. Okay, let's have here. And, and by the way, what do you think of Matt Dillahunty also? <laughs> so again, Matt Dillahunty. Oh yeah, similar. Yeah, same category, same category. I don't think he's thought things through really. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think he's the one that is now uh, dipping into uh, solipsism, where you know the world may not exist, and you, you just can't you you can't escape absurdity when when you try to defy the Christian worldview. Exactly, 
All right, let's have uh, Jeffrey Militante. Uh, why do some flat earthers say that their claims about the earth being flat comes from the Bible? Uh, what verses are referring to when they're making their case? So what the verses really meant in context? Yeah, I, um, I, I have an article on this topic. I have a couple articles. One that deals with um, th some, some things that are very obviously true that some Christians deny. They kind of go into this conspiracy theory mode where, you know, the government's trying to convince us the earth's round, but it's really flat and so on. So I have one article that kind of introduces that and it shows, it talks about Christians who den deny the roundness of the earth, uh, the truth of natural selection, which is a biblical principle actually, and um, di the existence of dinosaurs. And then I have another one that, that focuses in on the roundness of the earth. And mm -hmm. if you'll take a look at that second article, I actually brought in a few of the verses that these flat earthers claim. I might eventually do all of them the same way I did with uh, with this book for the alleged contradictions. I might go through each and every one of them. There aren't any verses in the Bible that say the earth's flat. I'm sorry, they're not there. Yeah. Um, some, some of the ones that they've uh, pulled out of context to try and make that case. One of them was something like, well, see, the earth has a face. The, this, the, the word that's used for the surface of the earth, panin, means face. That doesn't make it flat. I have a face. It's not flat. <laughs> right? it's, it's, not, it's not even logical. So, uh, and that's one of the ones I brought up on that website. And you can take a look at some of the other ones too, where they, they post this verse and I'm like, okay, I read the verse. Where are you getting flatness out of this verse? I don't see it. It's not there. And in any case, the Bible does say the earth's round in a couple of places. Isaiah 40, 22 talks about the circle of the earth. You could say, okay, but that could be a flat circle. But in Job uh, 26.10, where it says that God, it's referring to the earth, and it says that God inscribes a circle uh, on the surface of the waters at the boundary between light and darkness. That's referring to the Terminator. And the only way you can have that on water is if it's, if it's spherical, right? Because the earth's surface is mostly water. And so when you take a look at the um, the shape of the uh, uh, the, sun, the sunlight on the earth always forms a, a circle because the earth's spherical. And so mm -hmm. the Bible really is pretty clear about the roundness of the earth. And, and there are other verses that indicate it indirectly, like a global flood. You can't have a global flood without a globe. All right? if, if it's flat earth, the water runs out the sides. <laughs> it's it's yeah. not going to work. So you say, well, there's a lip around the edge. Well, then it, that constitutes a hill that's not covered by the water. And the Bible says all the high hills and the whole heavens were covered. That only works on a globe, folks. Exactly. Wow. That's amazing. <laughs> okay. Hmm. Okay, let's have here. Uh, many atheists use Matthew 16, 28 as the evidence Jesus uh, either lied or was incorrect. Uh, how can we answer this objection? Oh, yeah. Truly, 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 I say to you, there are some of those who are standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Uh, I think it's very easy to answer. There, there are more than, you need to understand that God can come in multiple ways. In the Old Testament, you know, God's coming with the clouds. He's coming in judgment to judge Egypt. I think that's in Isaiah 19, perhaps. In any mm -hmm. case, um, not every coming of Christ is the second coming of Christ or the final coming of Christ. And Jesus did come in judgment in AD 70 to judge the unrepentant, the unbelieving Jews. And he did that by destroying the temple. Uh, there was a period of time, about 40 years, about one generation between the the crucifixion of Christ, the, you know, the resurrection, and then the Christ's coming in judgment. And, and there were some that were still alive at that time. So this is not referring to the final coming of Christ. It's referring to his coming in judgment in AD 70 to destroy the temple, something that he prophesied in other places as well, that the temple would be, uh, the temple would be destroyed by God himself. And that showed that God is not favoring the unbelieving Jews at that point. Okay. Uh, yeah, since you brought up uh, the coming of Christ, I'm actually curious now, what is your view of the end times? <laughs> oh, no, I'm not going to go into that. <laughs> other, other, than, other than the essentials. The essentials are there will be in the future a physical return of Jesus Christ. The earth will melt with fervent heat. It will be remade. There will be a new heavens and a new earth. Mm -hmm. Those who have rejected salvation in Christ will experience eternity in the lake of fire. Those who have received Christ's mercy and grace will spend eternity on the new earth 
uh, serving him forever in the joy of the Lord. All right. Let's have another question. Okay. I think this will be our last question. Okay. So I have an atheist friend. How can I have uh, tips to convince him to believe in God? Or, yeah, yeah, what advice can you give to him? Okay. Romans 1 tells us that God has made himself inescapably known to everyone. Romans 1, verses 18 through 20 in particular. Uh, verse 18 indicates that this knowledge of God that has been revealed from heaven is suppressed by those who deny God. They suppress the truth in unrighteousness. But what? But God has made himself known to them. That's verse 19. God, God has made himself known to them such that when they look out into creation, they immediately recognize it as the handiwork of God. That's verse 20. Such that there is no excuse. They have no defense and apologia without an apologetic uh, there in verse 20. is actually the from the Greek there. They are without an excuse. Mm -hmm. And so you need to remember when you're dealing with somebody who professes to be an atheist, that person knows God and has tr tried very hard to convince himself that he does not know God. And he's yeah. trying to convince you that he does not know God. So keep that in mind. There are no true atheists. Everyone knows God. You're dealing with someone who knows God, who does not want to know God because that person doesn't want to live by God's standard. You can understand it. People don't want to believe in a God who is rightly angry at them for their sin. That is unpleasant. That is an yeah. uncomfortable thought. Yeah. They work very hard to try and say, oh, I don't believe in that God. So that's the first thing you need to recognize, that that person does believe in God. So what I try to do in apologetics is expose that person's suppressed knowledge of God. And I'm, I'm happy to say that to him. Actually, my friend, you do know. You do know God in your heart of hearts. And you demonstrate that you know God by the way that you live. Not that you live according to his law, but you recognize that there is a law that you need to live by. You have a sense of morality. That makes no sense in an atheistic universe. You have a sense of right and wrong. Atheists do. Uh, yeah. You have a sense of logic. You understand that you should abide by laws of logic in your reasoning. But that makes no sense in an atheistic worldview because laws of logic are universal, abstract, invariant rules of correct reasoning. That makes sense in a Christian worldview where we have a God who's sovereign over the entire universe. His thinking controls everything. His, his mind determines what's true, and therefore we need to follow his laws if we're going to think truthfully. Or the fact that you believe that science is possible, uh, that's something that would only make sense in a Christian universe where God upholds things in a consistent fashion for our benefit. Mm -hmm. uh, in an atheistic universe where stuff just happens, there, there's no reason to expect that science should work that our mind should have the capacity to be rational, that our senses should be reliable in probing the universe, that the universe should obey laws. How does that make any sense if there's no lawgiver? No. So, so you see, I, I would point out to this person who professes to be an atheist that he does know God and he's trying to convince himself and others that he doesn't know God, but it's not quite working because he demonstrates by his behavior that he does know God in that he has a sense of morality, he has a sense of logic, he has a sense of science, he believes in uh, human rationality and dignity and freedom, and these things only make sense in the Christian worldview. So that's the way I would go with it. And then the book that I wrote on this topic is called The Ultimate Proof of Creation. So have a look at that yes. book, The Ultimate Proof of Creation, and that'll kind of help you, give you some ideas for conversation starters. Yep. Okay. And... Uh... I thought this was, this was the last question. Well, I think we still have here. Uh, can we lose our salvation? Basically, you cannot lose your salvation if you're really a genuine Christian because the author of your salvation is Jesus Christ. He secures your salvation. Okay. And uh, what does it mean that we will judge angels? Does, does it mean we, will, uh, we are higher than angels? Well, um that's a difficult one. I'm not sure how to answer that. I, I uh, my my impression of it is that uh, we will have some degree in in. Of course, our judgment will be right at that point because at that point we'll be made like him. We'll be we'll, we'll be like God in terms of our character. So we'll, we'll judge with righteous judgments. And I'm thinking that's referring to uh, the rewards that angels receive uh, for their obedience. Uh, I'm thinking it's referring to godly angels, perhaps. But uh, I could be wrong about that. I could be wrong about that. I don't want to give a, mm -hmm. a whole lot of detail without studying that verse more. I'm familiar with the okay. verse. I just haven't yeah. given a whole lot of thought. But uh, yeah, in, in some sense, angels were, were made for our, our benefit. And uh, uh, Hebrews chapter 1, the last verse indicates that they're ministering spirits 
that were sent out to be it, it, it administrators of this plan of salvation. So uh, God did create angels for our benefit. We would be mm -hmm. wise to, if we get a message from an angel, we would be wise to heed it because it's from God. But angels were made for, for our behalf, interestingly. Okay. Thank you so much for that answer. And I think we are done with the Q&A. Thank you so much for all of your questions. And uh, yeah, uh, Juni, uh, we can get uh, the book of, uh, by the way, the book of Jason, Jason Lyle is entitled um, Keeping the Faith, Keeping Faith in the Age of Reason. There it is. Yeah. Yep. I have an ebook actually since I don't know where to order a hard, co hard copy. <laughs> Yeah, just get on our website, biblicalscienceinstitute.com. All right. Okay, so, do, yeah. Okay, Dr. Lyle, so shall we close in prayer? Okay. Mm -hmm. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this time. I pray that this was uh, beneficial to, to many. I pray it was uh, glorifying to you, encouraging mm -hmm. the Christians, and challenging to unbelievers, Lord. I pray mm -hmm. for my uh, friend Jordan. He'd continue to bless his ministry as well as uh, the Biblical Science Institute. And we pray that you would uh, uh, just bless people this this day, help them to get get in your word and get excited about uh, defending the faith. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Lyle, for accepting my invitation once again. And uh, have a great day, you and your family. Thanks. You too. Bye.